I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. An onion patch? Yes, an onion patch. I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. And all I do is cry all day. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. The air so strong it takes my breath away. I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. Well, won't you come and play with me? Man, that sucked. I'm David Van Vranken. Welcome to our 25th lecture here in Chemistry 51C at UC Irvine. <clears throat> I was cutting onions this weekend, and, um, you know, when you cut big batches of onions, I'm usually pretty chemically resistant, but, <laughs> it, you know, the fumes from onions even get to me, and it seems like there's a story here that we've all heard of, but I, I'm not sure if we all know the details. I couldn't remember exactly the details of why onions uh, are so noxious uh, and, and make you cry. And so let's go ahead and talk about the compound that is emitted from, from freshly cut onions uh, that really causes this tearing in the eye. The, uh, so any compound that causes you to tear is referred to as a lacrimator. We have compounds in our laboratory like isocyanates that are very powerful lacrimators, very small amounts uh, in the laboratory, you know, or like tear gas. But what's coming out of onions is a compound that is this weird looking thing that can, contains a carbon sulfur double bond. And you haven't seen anything like that. And, and let's go ahead and talk about this compound and how it's generated. It's called syn propene thiol S oxide. And, and so I want to focus on, on the components of the name that tell you what's the functional group there. Propene thiol, an al refers to an aldehyde, but it's a thiol. That means it's a CS double bond, kind of like a CO double bond. And you know that there's an oxygen attached to that sulfur, and, and that's why it's called an S oxide. You know, if it, an oxide just means there's an oxygen somewhere, and the fact that it's an S oxide tells you that the oxygen is attached to the S. And they're even telling you this, the stereochemistry, syn, that that means it's a cis carbon sulfur double bond and not a trans carbon sulfur double bond. And where does this compound come from? Because if you take an onion in, in the grocery store before you cut into it, it there's nothing special about that that would let you know that you're about to start crying if, you, if those compounds get into your eyes. So there's a, a, a sequence of biochemical reactions that converts a compound inside of onion cells into a compound, this propene thiol S oxide, that is a powerful lacrimator. So there's two enzymes that are responsible for that. So floating around inside of onion cells, you've got this sulfoxide molecule that's derived from cysteine. Let me go ahead and just paint here a picture so you can see this carboxylate, this ammonium group, this carbon, and that sulfur are a natural part of the amino acid cysteine. It's one of the 20 ribosomally incorporated amino acids that are uh, common in all organisms on the planet Earth. But this extra stuff on there, that extra three carbon chain and the oxygen, the O minus, th these are not a normal part of cysteine. But this metabolite is floating around in onion cells in particular. And the enzyme alleinase converts this, fragments this molecule. It's, it's a class of, of paracyclic reactions called a retroene reaction. It cuts this molecule right here. The O minus is going to pick up an oxygen. I, I can't resist drawing the, the mechanism for this, so let me go ahead and do this. The O minus picks up the, the proton. These electrons kick over to here, and these electrons go to sulfur. Let's refer to it as a retroene elimination reaction. And there's an enzyme that catalyzes that. You could do that in the laboratory if you just heated this to about 150 degrees. But in the presence of alleinase, it occurs at room temperature, uh, possibly below. Then there's a second reaction. You end, that, that first enzyme converts uh, the s alkenyl cysteine sulfoxide into a, a class that is so crazily unstable. This functional group here with the SO, SOH, is called a sulfenic acid. It's not a sulfonic acid like when you sulfonate a benzene ring. It's a sulfenic acid. You've never seen a sulfenic acid in our class so far. 
these types of compounds are, are completely unstable. If you try to concentrate them down, they react with each other. <laughs> so you can't isolate these compounds. Um, but in the brief time that this sulfenic acid is floating around in the cell, before it has a chance to fall apart, react with other sulfur molecules or other nucleophiles, there's an enzyme inside of onion cells called lacrimatory factor synthase. <laughs> I, I wish that biochemistry had something like IUPAC nomenclature because um, you can't get any information about the structure of the substrate from the name. It tells you it makes a lacrimator, but they ought to name the enzyme so you can tell something about the, either the structure of the enzyme or, or the reaction they catalyze. Well, this compound catalyzes a tautomerization. In, in other words, what's happening here is a proton is moving from one part of the structure to another part of the structure. We call that tautomerization. And the enzyme, without it, this would be a slow process um, relative to, to the degradation of this sulfenic acid. So if this synthase enzyme grabs a hold of this sulfenic acid, it very rapidly transfers this proton to this carbon. And it, that's what generates this powerful lacrimator. So why is it that onions in the store aren't emitting these fumes, these, this propene thiol S oxide and causing everybody in, in the grocery store or at your farmer's market to, um, to cry? Well, that's because onion cells are compartmentalized. I'm sure you've learned about this in your high school biology classes, that if you look at a cell, it has various compartments, like a nucleus, like mitochondria. And if we were to look at an onion cell, inside of the onion cell, the enzyme alleinase, there's two L's, two I's, alleinase, is located inside of vacuoles. Whereas the substrate, that first substrate for that first reaction is sitting in the cytoplasm or else it's located inside of other vesicles inside of the cell and it is kept separate from that alleinase enzyme. It's not until you come along and you cut <clears throat> the cells open and you start to allow those components to mix, that's what causes all of those, um, that chain of events that ultimately leads to the formation um, of that propene thiol S um, S oxide, that syn propene thiol cysteine oxide. So it's just this compartmentalization that keeps those apart. Uh, and you'll find many examples like that in nature where uh, until you bust open the cell, like indigo plants, you, nothing, you won't note that there's something colored or something that's noxious inside those cells. Okay, so next time you're cutting onions, be thinking about these sulfur compounds, these weird sulfur compounds that have these functional groups in there that look like this carbon sulfur double bond. Wow, you're never gonna see those again in our course. I don't think it's an obscure functional group. Let's return back. To what we've been working on. Um, you know, our last few days, I, I told you I wasn't planning on giving you any new material this week. I was simply going to review problem solving skills that would help you uh, for our exams, that would help you uh, for other courses or other things that you might be doing beyond this course. And so let's go ahead and continue where we left off. I, I'm taking the content here um, from all over the, um, the, the Chemistry 51C course that we've been teaching. Um, and so when we left off, I, we were talking about a problem uh, from an MCAT practice exam that was about how do you rank the acidity of these phenolic compounds, and that's usually all about resonance. Um, the only way that you can judge acidity in my class or in any other venue that you're working on acidity, really, for the acidity of neutral compounds, if you want to think about that, you need to draw the conjugate base of those compounds. And so I told you that we had to draw the conjugate bases and then look out at how stable those conjugate bases are, right? It, anything that generates a stable conjugate base is probably likely to be acidic. Um, because it wants to generate a stable conjugate base. And that's what allowed us to sort and rank these various compounds, these various phenolic compounds by acidity. So just remember, when I'm asking you questions about acidity, you've got to go through all this work of drawing out the conjugate bases. There's no escape from that. You may think, I don't want to draw out chemical structures. I'm too busy. You can't be too busy to actually work the question. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, I, I took another question uh, out of um, 
this one came out of Reddit. Somebody had posted a question about one of these uh, about one of these exams that they found on a this looks like an MCAT uh, study question. And so somebody's posting a question that they found and they didn't understand where they say, what is the product of this reaction? So you can see what's going on here. They've taken a carb. The question is asking, if you have a carboxylic acid and you treat it with a Grignard reagent, what is it that you expect to happen? Boy, I, I know this answer right off because I guess I've been doing organic chemistry a long time, but at, at your stage, the things that you need to think about is, is this. Grignard reagents are strong nucleophiles, but they are also powerful bases. So, and the first thing that happens is the acid-base chemistry. Protons move quickly. So you can't do Grignard reactions in water. The water rapidly protonates the Grignard reagent. You can't do Grignard reactions in the presence of alcohols because the OH will rapidly protonate the Grignard reagent. And obviously carboxylic acids are more acidic than alcohols in water. So the thing we really have to consider here is that there's, um, is that, that there's an OH, an acidic OH on the substrate. And, um, <clears throat> and that's this OH right here. So that H is going to be deprotonated faster, certainly faster than you attack the carbonyl. So, right, there's uh, the thing that you would expect to happen. Let me go ahead and draw out this bromomagnesium compound. That bond is super basic and super nucleophilic. And what's going to happen first before any attack on any carbonyls is acid-base chemistry. And so the end product of this reaction is initially going to be a carboxylate anion and then you get this bromomagnesium counter ion, and that's going to form a bond, and that's going to lead you to get product C here. Uh, you're not gonna substitute the OH um, to give a ketone, because you're gonna deprotonate the carboxylic acid. You're not going to, I don't know what they're trying to draw here. <laughs> There's no source of a hydrido group in this whole reaction mechanism, so that's not going to happen. You're not gonna add this CH3 group, right? right here because that means you didn't deprotonate first. So that's, so that's not going to happen. So you need to take into account um, that strong nucleophiles like alkalithiums, like hydridoaluminates, like Grignard reagents are, are going to do acid-base reactions with alcohols and carboxylic acids faster than they'll ever react with a carbonyl. So <clears throat> that's why we, we, we run all of our reactions in our laboratory in anhydrous nitrogen gas that has no water vapor. We, we really avoid water or OHs when we do organic chemistry. Okay, here's a, um, all the questions aren't MCAT questions. I, I, this just happens to be three in a row. This comes from another, this is from the Princeton Review Books. It's an MCAT study question. Um, and in my experience, when I look at the types of questions that are being asked on the dental exam, the DAT, the, the, the pharmacy, and the optometry exam, they all look pretty similar to me. Okay, here's a question where they're giving you two reagents. They're giving you a ketone, right, right here, this ketone. I guess I'm kind of covering that up. And they're giving you this weird, weird functional group that you've never seen before. We used to teach about these functional groups back when I took organic chemistry in the 1970s um, <clears throat> because they were used to make stable uh, solid compounds that had easily definable melting points. So they really stretched back into ancient history here to talk about this reaction. Um, I hope these conditions look familiar to you. These are the conditions for imine formation. And I know this doesn't look like any amine that you've ever seen before, but this amine right here is super reactive at forming imines. So let me just remind you what happens when you, when you take imines or carbonyl compounds like ketones or aldehydes. And it doesn't really matter, there's extra spinach that's hanging off the edge there. But we told you that if you take uh, amino compounds like this and you put those in the presence of quote unquote mildly acidic conditions, usually acetic acid, um, I'll just write here ACOH for acetic acid because I can't fit anything longer in there. That's our abbreviation for acetic acid. Well, the product of that reaction when it's catalyzed by acetic acid is an imine. 
And what we didn't tell you is that there's a very particular kind of amino group compound called hydrazines that make a very stable type of amine called a hydrazone. So this is called hydrazine. And usually, these are so facile, you don't even need to add acetic acid to these, but I'll draw that anyways. It's fast even without catalytic acetic acid. It's fast, and these compounds are so stable, it makes them actually a little bit hard to hydrolyze. So you've never seen this particular type of, of imine before, but this particular type of imine is called a hydrazone. And this particular type of hydrazine derivative up here, where there's an acyl group on there, uh, makes um, um, a very particular, uh, or I think this is called a carbazone or something, or semi-carbazone. It's been a long time since I worked with these. But this particular product over here that you get for this reaction is going to look very similar. Let me draw the answer in red here so we can see the answer in its full glory. Again, we didn't talk about this type of imine before in our class. Uh, let me pull back here and not draw the, I'll go straight to the, the semi-carbazone derivative. So if you look at what's going to happen here, this is going to be the NH2 that can form um, um, a CN double bond. You can't form a CN double bond with this one over here easily because it's already donating into the carbonyl, so it's not reactive. Let me just write not reactive. You're not going to form any imine with this NH2 that's next to a carbonyl. So if you follow through the, uh, um, the, the pattern of reactivity here, what you'll end up getting is this particular derivative. And again, we didn't talk about these hydrazines and how easily they form imines, these special imines called hydrazones. Um, yeah, so that would be a little bit challenging. What, how would you work that problem? You'd have to recognize uh, you'd have to recognize that this NH can't even form a CN double bond because it's only got one free NH. So then you're deciding between the other two nitrogens. And then there's the one that's not reactive, the nitrogen that's not reactive. One of the NH2s is not reactive because the double bonds are donating into the carbonyl, whereas this other uh, NH2 group, super reactive, super nucleophilic in aqueous conditions. Okay, so it's kind of a kind of a, a tricky question. And if we were teaching organic chemistry like we did 50 years ago, you would have already memorized this, um, this, this reagent and this transformation because it makes a very stable type of imine called a hydrazone. Let's see, here's a question I uh, came out of Course Hero. Somebody was posting the answer key to one of my colleagues' exams. Um, you know, I, I put all of my answer keys online. I, sometimes I've seen people post my answer keys on Course Hero, but it's like I, I already posted online. Why, why would you um, need to do that? The, the question it was really quite blurry because I didn't want to pay for the Course Hero thing, but um, but I can I can tell exactly the question that's being asked here. The question is: Here's three types of compounds, and which of these sites is is most reactive versus least reactive. You're supposed to rank them in order, in order of decreasing reactivity. So what's easiest for me is to recognize the one that doesn't react with any known nucleophile that we're going to teach you in, in, in our class. And that's this acetal right here. This, this acetal functional group will not react with any base. It will not react with any nucleophile that we've ever shown you. It, it, it can't. There's, that's why we protect aldehydes as acetals, is so they won't react when we do Grignard chemistry or lithium aluminum hydride. So B, without question, quite easily and straightforward, is the least reactive. So again, site B is not, nothing will ever attack that. Now, if you put acid in there, right, well, let me just don't don't write this on the thing, but if you treat that with acid, now all kinds of stuff will happen. That's how you remove those protecting groups is you just touch them with some acid and water and they fall off. But as long as you keep the acid out, that thing is rock stable. The, the challenging part here is to uh, recognize the difference in, in reactivity, to be able to rank the difference in reactivity between an amide and an alkyl bromide. And Honestly, I never told you how to do that, and the book doesn't tell you how to do that. And my group just published a research paper 
uh, this year that for the first time ranks and quantifies the reactivity of electrophiles. So before that, nobody could do this. I'm going to tell you that if you guesstimate, and this is a guesstimate, it's very hard to compare alkyl halides um, uh, with amides. If you estimate the reactivity of ease of attack of an amide versus an alkyl iodide, I don't know about the bromide, it's a little bit less reactive. So how easily can you attack an alkyl iodide versus a, a carbonyl? Um, the alkyl iodide is about 10 to the 17th more reactive. 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th, more electrophilic. And uh, all right, electrophilic. Philic. 10 to the 17. That's one followed by 17 zeros. It's not a million, it's not a billion, it's not a trillion. It's a number so big, I don't even know what the number is called. Methyl bromide is a little bit less reactive, but it's still going to be way more reactive than a, a, an amide carbonyl. So the, the problem with the amide carbonyl, carbonyls generally are, are much more well-behaved than alkyl bromides. But that doesn't mean that they're always more reactive, right? The, the real reason that we don't like alkyl bromides is we don't like competing E2 elimination reactions. So, you know, based on what I know, the, this compound C is, should be substantially more reactive. Is it 10 to the 17? Probably not. <laughs> but it's way more reactive than an amide. And so the correct order here would be this. I wouldn't ask you this because I don't, I never told you how to compare the reactivity of an amide or an ester or uh, versus an alkyl bromide. Um, this would be the correct order of events that the alkyl halide, whether it's a bromide or iodide, should be way more reactive than an amide versus no chance of you ever attacking that, uh, that acetal that's completely unreactive. <clears throat> and, um, you know, really, let me come back to this. The only reactions that we've shown you where things can attack uh, this amide, the only types of reactions where we've shown that to be possible is hydroxide anion. All right, that's the only, um, <clears throat> I guess if you, uh, if you make an NN dialkyl amide, a tetrahydrotoaluminate counter ion. Uh, can attack the carbonyl. Uh, if there's an NH on there, it deprotonates first. But if you have two alkyl groups on the nitrogen, then the hydrodyl aluminate can attack, but you usually have to heat those. Whereas lots of things will do SN2 on alkyl bromides. All right. <clears throat> these these fill-in-the-box questions here don't come from any external source. I just wanted to be able to review with you some of the common reactions that we covered uh, related to green yard chemistry or hydrido reagents with reaction uh, with esters and particularly cyclic esters. I find uh, throughout this quarter that people somehow get confused when, when you have rings. Like if the ring opens up suddenly, it's like, what? Where's the leaving group? Well, it's attached to your molecule. So uh, a, a cyclic ester is referred to as a lactone. That's the specific word we use. Let's go ahead and review some of the key reagents and the key transformations that we've learned this quarter. So you've learned that Grignard reagents add two equivalents to esters. You can't stop at one single addition. And we have to follow those with a, um, with a workup. So the reaction that happens here is we're going to add two phenyl groups where that ester was. And after the workup, that gets protonated. But what happened to this other piece here? You, you have this other alcohol piece. Well, that's attached. It doesn't go anywhere. It's attached by a four-carbon chain to that carbonyl group. And so you have to remember to draw that attached through a four-carbon chain to wherever the ester carbonyl was. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you can do a, a more beautiful job drawing that uh, those four carbons, those four CH2 groups. but. Um, uh, but that's, you know, it, it gets a little bit confusing if you haven't practiced using cyclic substrates. Uh, I hope you all remember that when you take esters and you reduce them with dibal H, you get aldehydes. Boy, what a great reaction to give uh, aldehydes. And so um, this, is, this would be an answer that I would give full credit for. But I, you know what I hope you would remember? I hope that you would remember that when you have hydroxyaldehydes, they prefer to be cyclized around. Here's the A plus answer that you would give, that the true answer after you work up this reaction uh, will actually exist 
mostly over 90% of your product, it'll be in equilibrium will exist as this cyclic pyridose. So uh, you might not remember that from the, the chapter on acetals and hemiacetals that where we covered that. Uh, but these particular types of five and six membered ring um, hydroxyaldides prefer to be cyclized around. Now lithium aluminum hydride completely reduces carbonyl groups down. Um, and let me go ahead and draw the H's here just so you can see the two H's that got added. And once again, the leaving group here is attached. I'll make it point this other direction to the um, to that newly reduced alcohol chain. So this is a, a completely symmetrical, even though I drew the H's on one side. One, two, three, four, five. Um, it's a pentane diol um, where both ends are, are primary alcohols. <clears throat> sodium borohydride, this is kind of a trick question at the bottom here. Uh, sodium borohydride is not reactive enough to react with esters. So <laughs> the, the real answer is that's only for ketones and aldehydes. So I'm just going to say no reaction. That doesn't work. Um, and, and I expect you to know that. It doesn't matter whether it's a cyclic ester or an acyclic ester. If you want to reduce ester groups, you have to use lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, that's the only way to do that. Okay, so these are just uh, uh, some really critical transformations that I expect you to know as you walk out of this course. Uh, and you can see the kinds of questions that will come up on MCATs, the things like Grignard reagents and Hydrido reagents, or they expect you to still remember that chemistry when you walk out of this class. Um, for those of you who are here at uh, UC Irvine, you're probably taking a biochemistry course called Biosci 98 um, out of the Leninger textbook. I think that's the textbook that you use. And I, I pulled this reaction out of one of the figures in the textbook uh, where they talk about forming something called a shift base. What is a shift base? Um, a, a shift base is actually, oh, I don't know how old this, this terminology is. It sounds like it's like 1910, 1920, uh, who knows? I, I'm just, uh, I have no idea. A shift base is just an old fashioned name for an imine. Uh, that's just this old name. I, I don't know why they don't, and this, this functional group that they call a shift base, it's kind of pissing me off because there's actually no lone pairs. That's not a base. It's already protonated. It's an acid. They've drawn the aminium ion form. It's the conjugate acid of a shift base. Uh, but that's okay. Let's just focus on the CN double bond. What they're showing you is how enzymes that are dependent on pyridoxal phosphate uh, can form imines. And so let's go ahead and walk through this mechanism. They, they show you some part of the first step of this mechanism here. Um, where the, the imine lone pairs, whoa, what just, how, how do I get like, wow, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not really good at using this note taking app that well. Okay, they show you the first step of, of this shift base attacking where the amino group is attacking the aldehyde. Let's go ahead and uh, follow through with that arrow pushing mechanism. We still need to show how you break the, um, the electrons one of the bonds in that CO pi bond, and we'll go ahead and draw the next functional group. Now, I'm not going to draw this whole pyridinium group, this pyridinium with the phosphate and the hydroxy group. Don't worry about those. All, all of this stuff right here is just a handle for the enzyme to grab onto. It's this unmistakable functional group that when an enzyme grabs that, it knows it's grabbing pyridoxal and not some other component that's floating around in the cell. That contributes to the KM for, for binding of the substrate to the enzyme. Okay, let's go ahead and keep going here with the mechanism. You know, the, it's a six, well, it's a five-step arrow pushing mechanism to form this aminium ion product. I'm not going to draw the whole uh, aldehyde functional group, but we can go ahead and draw these components here. And, and then I'll just write aryl here, aryl, A-R. It's not argon, it's aryl. It's my abbreviation for that pyridinium group. And now that lysine side chain that's embedded in the pyridoxal enzyme has added to that. And so you get that. I'll just call this lyse. Maybe I should call it K. You should have memorized the, if you've taken a biochemistry course, you would have memorized the one letter codes for the amino acid. Um, so the next step is that we, uh, um, you know, in, as a chemist, if I want fast rates for imine formation, I have acids in there. And most certainly in that enzyme active site, there's going to be some catalytic acid. 
I don't know who knows what the uh, what it, which amino acid is is poised above the um, above that O minus in order to protonate it. So I'll just draw a functional group uh, abbreviated as AH. And now we'll pick up a proton. This is the same mechanism we drew in class. It's just that I've got aryl and I've got lysine attached to the amino group. And so the next intermediate is going to have OH. Boy, there's so much organic chemistry in your biochemistry classes. And um, it's too bad that, that whoever's teaching that isn't... Um, well, well, I don't know that they are, but usually they don't focus enough on, on the organic chemistry that's going on. So certainly somewhere else in, in the enzyme active site, there's another functional group that can serve as a catalytic base. It's not the same one that, that protonated it. It'll be a, a different uh, functional group in the enzyme active site that can pull this proton off and then generate this neutral aminal intermediate. Here's that aryl group, and I think I'm missing something here. I, I, I don't know why I switched this H and the OH around to different positions. I didn't mean to confuse you with that. And you'll recall the mechanism in class. We said you need to put a second proton on this leaving group. And so I'll draw, maybe there's some other functional group in the enzyme active site. And then we'll pick up that proton. And there we go. We're ready to eliminate out this, uh, this water leaving group. AR is that pyridinium ring. And now we're going to push out the water, and that's going to generate this aminium ion intermediate, which they refer to as a shift base. And so it's going to lead to, well, let me go ahead and redraw that just with my own pen drawing, and then we'll just compare the two structures here. So the end result of this is that you'll have AR, you'll have that H there, you'll have that aminium ion, lyse, plus, and then H2O is now left and drifts out, and that's, that's the same as this product here. So, you know, so many of these catalytic cycles and reactions that you learn in biochemistry classes, they're the same ones that we teach you in organic chemistry, but you just don't have time when you're learning so many catalytic cycles, Krebs cycle, um, uh, so many metabolic pathways and catabolic pathways. There's just no time for you to dwell on the organic chemistry mechanisms, which it's kind of a shame because <laughs> um, that's the cool stuff to me. <laughs> the the biology is cool too. Biochemistry is cool. What's this? Here's a, um, somebody on Chegg posted an answer for uh, an exam. I don't know whose class this was. Um, <clears throat> but you can, I think I can see here if I, if I look at this, uh, I'm going to struggle here. It looks to me like using the Wittig reaction, prepare, and uh, they've got this big complex molecule here. This is part of the substrate molecule. Prepare this, this compound. So let's go ahead and draw, see if I can draw up that compound. It looks to me like you're being asked, how do you prepare? And they don't tell you the starting material, they just say you have to use a Wittig reaction somewhere in your synthesis. <laughs> how do you prepare? There's a benzene ring on here, there's a methyl group, there's a CH, and I see a CH2. Then I see a double bond. And at the end of this double bond, it looks to me like there's two methyl groups. So if I'm squinting very hard, it's the, the picture quality wasn't great. So how do you prepare this somehow using a Wittig reaction? Um, it, it could be 15 steps. It could be 20 steps as far as I know. Uh, but somewhere along the way, you need to use a Wittig reaction. You use Wittig reactions to prepare CC double bonds. And so there's two different ways when you've got a CC double bond. There's two different ends that could have been the phosphonium or the carbonyl group. Let's go ahead and consider both of those. So one possible approach would be to make this using a Wittig reaction where we have the carbonyl here. Let me just write pH because we don't even care about that benzene ring. I'm just going to write pH there to represent the benzene. And that means the other piece that we would have would have to have that illid structure 
that triphenylphosphonium group, and these two components would mix together in order to give that product. But let's consider the other alternative possibility because there's another way to use the Wittig reaction. It would be if I had that phosphonium group here and I had the carbonyl on this other side. So there's two different ways you could have used a Wittig reaction to assemble this molecule in a, in a single step. So let me just circle this so it doesn't look like it's part of the. So there's two different approaches and we're really just trying to decide which of these is the better approach. I think what I told you is that the challenge is oftentimes either controlling the stereochemistry, the easy stereochemistry, or being able to make the Wittig reaction in the first place. And in this case, um, there's not a possibility of E and Z isomers because two of the groups on one side are methyl. The, the, cis, there's no such thing as cis and trans. There's only one possible geometry for that. So you can't even assign an E and Z to that. O over here, when we look at, at this at, at this possibility over here, I'm I'm already worried because I don't feel like I don't feel like I could efficiently make this Wittig reagent because a Wittig reaction involves um, an SN2 process. So let's go ahead and draw that out. If I wanted to make this Wittig reagent, I would do that by deprotonating this. That's no problem. If I could make this, that would be no problem. And I'll just put an X minus. I don't know whether it's bromide. So no problem doing, the problem is making this, that the way you make Wittig reagents is through SN2 reactions. And I'm just gonna say, this would be a bad SN2 reaction on a secondary alkyl halide. Do you remember all this stuff that you had to memorize about how you get competing eliminations? Is it gonna be E2 or SN2? And you know, there's just, it's a bad SN2. You're gonna get a lot of competing elimination. This is not the way to make this compound. So this bottom root is, is just lousy because we don't have a good way uh, to do this SN2 reaction. Whereas making primary alkyl halides, the, if I work backwards a little bit um, here with, the, with, this, with this other type of species, and I talk about making that, um, that Wittig reagent, it could be bromide or iodide, doesn't matter. Uh, um, and then you add triphenylphosphine, you'd have no problems doing an alkylation, an SN2 reaction on a primary alkyl halide like that. Could be an iodide, could be a bromide, could be a tosylate. You'd have no problem with that. So really this would be the favored route. Um, if they're asking you to, uh, to provide the answer, this would be the best answer uh, over here, it would be following this kind of a route. How would you make that? But they don't tell you how far backwards you have to go <laughs> With your, with your starting materials. So, um, you know, I'm not clear whether they're asking you to describe how to synthesize the Wittig reagent, if that's even part of the question. Uh, but uh, it's a semi-deep question. We, we talked about this in our class. And when you, if you take Chemistry 51C or a similar class from other people, they will talk about this issue that you, you can't make every possible Wittig reagent. Some are hard to make because you have to use SN2 reactions to make them. Okay, here's a question from the pharmacy college admissions test. Um, and this is a little bit challenging. I, I told you that I don't cover IUPAC nomenclature in my class, but some exams expect you to know IUPAC nomenclature. So this question doesn't even tell you the structures. They expect you to be able to draw them out. So let's go ahead and focus on what they're telling you. The question is which of the following, A, B, C, D, would be the best method of producing methyl propanoate. So if you can't draw methyl propanoate or any of the other compounds that they're talking about in these questions, you have no chance of answering this question. So this is an ester. Propanoate, is, it's a methyl ester. So let me go ahead and draw out what is propanoate. Propanoate is derived from propanoic acid. There's three carbons in propanoic acid. So, that's a three carbon carboxylic acid. I just didn't draw the H. But this is the methyl ester. It's not the carboxylic acid. So we need to put a, so they're, they're asking you this, which of the following would be the best method to produce this ester? That's what they're asking you. So let's take a look at what your choices are. Okay, choice A is react propanoic acid
So you have to know the chemical structure of propanoic acid in order to be able to answer that. And methanol in the presence of a mineral acid. So, in the presence of a mineral acid. That looks like it would work to me. What's a mineral acid? That's something that doesn't contain carbon. Sulfuric acid, that's powerful. Hydrochloric acid, that's powerful. No carbon in there. Acetic acid is not a mineral acid. A carboxylic acid is not a mineral acid. They have carbon in there. So I'll just use HCl. Wouldn't matter if you picked high, sulf uh, sulfuric acid or nitric, <laughs> I mean, nobody would use nitric acid because it's also an oxidizing agent. But HCl, this is a, a method that we taught you in the class. It's called a Fischer esterification. And so that would work. That would be an efficient method. But before we put that as our answer, as the best method, let's compare this to some of the other methods. Okay, so B is, how about reacting propanoyl chloride? That's an acyl chloride. So that's, pro if I start by drawing prop propanoic acid and I change it to a chloride, that's propanoyl chloride. So we're working on B right now. Whoops, we're working on B. Um, this is propanoyl chloride that I've just drawn. With ethanol, I, it's kind of obvious they're trying to trick you there. <laughs> Obviously, you're trying to make an ethyl ester. Why would you put ethanol in there? So alcohols and acyl chlorides are a great way to compare, prepare esters, but this would make the wrong ester in the presence of a base. And the base that I, I told you was pyridine. Let me just write base here. We told you to use pyridine in these. This would be a great way to make an ethyl ester, but you're, you're not being asked to make an ethyl ester. You're being asked to make a, a, a methyl ester. So great reaction, but wrong product. And that's just right here, wrong product. So obviously that's not right. Whoops, I didn't mean to erase that. I meant to draw an X through that. Okay, let's try to check out Answer number C, reacting propanoyl chloride. Here we go with propanoyl chloride again. Wow, acid chlorides are so reactive. Love them. Um, with an aqueous base. Well, <laughs> okay, they're not saying what aqueous base, but if it's aqueous, they, they mean hydroxide anion. I don't know why they can't just say sodium hydroxide. Maybe they think they're trying to confuse you by not calling it sodium hydroxide. So I'll write them charge separated. There's a sodium oxygen bond. This, this would be a great way to destroy the carboxylic acid that you probably just finished making in the lab. Uh, the initial product of this is going to be, let me put it in brackets. I'm not sure if you remember this, but the initial product is going to be the hydroxide anion will substitute the chloride through a two-step mechanism. But in the presence of aqueous base, the second you form a carboxylic acid, the next molecule of hydroxide is going to deprotonate it before it attacks any other acyl chlorides. So right, the, the thing that you would isolate at the end, um, you'd certainly efficiently hydrolyze your product to something useless. You get water, but who cares? But that's not what they asked you to make. So certainly that would be a crazily fast reaction, but that doesn't lead to anything that you want based on what's in this question. And then finally D, it says reacting propanoic acid with ethanol. This sounds like the first reaction again. With ethanol in the presence of a mineral acid. I'll use HCl again, but it could be sulfuric acid. Well, that would work. That's called a Fischer esterification and it would give us ethyl propanoate, but that's the wrong product again. Right? It would work, but it's the wrong product. I'm not sure if you find that all that tricky, them switching methyl and ethyl. I, um, but that obviously doesn't work. So let's go ahead and... Okay, so the answer to this question is A. Um, so what's tricky about this? You have to know some carbonyl chemistry, uh, functional group transformations from uh, carboxylic acid derivatives. For us, that was chapter 22 in the Grzynski smith textbook in, in the fifth edition. Uh, and we had a ton of practice. It require, This particular question requires you to know how to name compounds, uh, simple ester derivatives and carboxylic acid derivatives and acyl chloride derivatives. Let's go ahead and take a look at another question here. I think we have time. 
uh, to work another problem. Uh, let's see, this is a some Chegg study. Somebody posted this on Chegg. What the, I swear this looks like our textbook. I can't remember whether the, I'm not sure if this was in our textbook or um, or where this came from. Uh, let's see, chapter 23. That was our enolate chapter, alkylation. It looks like it comes out of the Gorzinski Smith. I can't remember how I found this problem. This is a tricky problem because um, and I recognize this problem because we had a problem very similar to this on on one of our discussion sections. But they made this super duper difficult here by drawing this complex product, which is not, this really has, part of this question has really nothing to do with, or, or very little to do with the actual question. What they're asking you is if you take this 1,3-dicarbonyl compound, let me draw it out for you so it's completely clear what they're asking you. If you take this 1,3-dicarbonyl compound, right, it's super easy to make enolates of those. Um, and you take this alkyl halide, which is interesting because it has two alkyl bromides on there. There's one, there's the other. So it can form, be attacked twice on each carbon bromine, on each carbon. Um, and then they add two equivalents of base. They're giving you a hint there. They're asking you what happens. And um, let's go ahead and draw what, what's going on here. They tell you it's eventually going to be useful for making a ludin. And they're not telling you, like, well, what part of a ludin are you trying to make? Like, over here, I see a pattern where there's hydroxy, um, where I see that there's a hydroxy here and two carbons and another hydroxy. Well, that kind of looks like this 1-3 pattern, but really the pattern that you're looking for is this. They're kind of giving you a hint that, that somehow this is a key reaction in making a ludin. So whatever answer you give ought to be useful for making this some part of a ludin. And my eyes are drawn to that cyclopropane. Let's go ahead and want, look at what's happening. When you treat ethyl acetoacetate or 1,3-dicarbonyls um, with sodium ethoxide, they deprotonate. I expect you to know that after chapter 23. This is the way we used to do enolate chemistry 50 years ago. And so when you deprotonate and then you treat that with an alkylating agent like this, dibromoethane, let me draw the bond the other way, it's going to do an SN2 reaction. This was a major theme for us. So it's going to do SN2, and you're going to form a carbon-carbon bond. There's only one equivalent of this alkyl dibromide in here. And then the Br- minus leaving group is just floating away. Goodbye. But there's a second equivalent of sodium ethoxide in here. And so what happens with that second equivalent of sodium ethoxide? Well, there's still another acidic proton on there. It's just as acidic as the first proton was. Um, and so you're going to get another deprotonation event to make another enolate. You can't stop that from happening. Because there's two equivalents of that sodium ethoxide in there. but there's only one equivalent of the alkyl bromide. So now what? <laughs> well, if you look at that carbanion and you look at that bromide, they're three atoms away. And so what's going to happen here, and this may seem kind of freaky to you, I hope it does, is that you're gonna cyclize to form a three-membered ring. <laughs> Whoa, let me, I, I, I did that. I did that wrong. Wow, I keep <laughs> messing up here. So you're going to cyclize to form a three-membered ring like that. And that's the cyclopropane that ends up in this compound Eludin S, uh, which is an anti-tumor. Well, I'm not sure. It looks like a that, that alkylates DNA. If you take uh, um, if you take chemistry 128, you'll learn about how this compound causes tumors by alkylating DNA. I guess it could potentially cure cancer if you could cross them with the DNA. Um, so again, now that I look at this a little bit more carefully, I'm going to draw out my, my product. Just to be clear, that I can clearly see there's a methyl group in my product, there's a carbonyl group in my product, there's a cyclopropane in my product, and then over here there's you know, another some more stuff. So uh, in my product, I see that I've generated a functional group that kind of maps onto here. Um, 
onto that eludinous. So that's a useful way for making a cyclopropane. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop right there. Let me see what I've got here. I'm going to go ahead and stop right there and we'll pick up where we left off on Wednesday. Um, again, the kinds of questions that you're going to see that where you really need organic chemistry, if you take biochemistry classes after this, if you, uh, if you plan to go to some sort of a health related professional school related to medicine or dentistry or pharmacy or optometry or uh, any of those, or if you plan to go to graduate school in organic chemistry, for sure, you'll be taking standardized exams where they expect you to know something from this class. So uh, I urge you to invest in this class. And we have an exam coming up that's going to cover exactly this type of chemistry, like aldol. I'm looking at the, this page that's in front of us. That This is screaming hot aldol chemistry here. Bases and aldehydes and carbonyl compounds. There's an exam coming up on Friday. I want you to be ready for that. Take advantage of our office hours. Uh, take, go to our discussion sections, ask questions, um, and really practice these problem-solving skills, many of which you're going to need to have for a, quite a long time to, uh, to power you forward. Okay, thanks for coming to, uh, to our problem-solving review lecture. I don't even know what you call this. Um, and... Um, Thanks for coming. <laughs>